Fly with Von Drake. And now your host, Walt Disney. One of the popular pastimes today is guessing what kind of life may exist on other worlds out in space. A few far out guessers range as far as the territory of uh, Alpha Centauri, the nearest star, 25,000 billion miles away. But most people prefer to speculate about Mars. It's a good prospect and it's close to home, only a little more than 48 million miles out there. Almost everybody has ideas about life on Mars. And as far as we know now, one guess is as good as another. So our studio artists have put together a composite of many people's impressions of what life is like on Mars. Although scientific evidence seems to indicate that Mars is a cold, desolate world, many scientists today speculate on what the planet might be like if conditions were somewhat different. With a little more water and oxygen than expected, there could be an astonishing array of life on Mars. A totally different sequence of living things following its own pattern of evolution. There may be plant life that migrates in search of richer soil. There may be plants that feed on other plants. or even plants that feed on themselves. And if animal life has developed on Mars, it too may have taken many new and unexpected forms. There could be animals with heavy insulation to conserve body heat in the sub-freezing night. If it is true that there are dust storms on Mars, life could have evolved ways of protecting itself. On the other hand, there might be creatures that actually thrive on the ever-present dust. Some organisms working with powerful digestive acids may be able to feed directly on minerals in the rocks, leaving a fantastic Martian sculpture in their wake. If in the thin Martian air there are creatures that fly, their wings of necessity must be four times as large as those on Earth. However, flight may be achieved by other means. On Mars, even as on Earth, life would surely be a competitive struggle for survival. There might be fantastic hunters who kill by concentrating the heat of the sun on their victims. Devastating creatures that envelop their quarry in shrouds of poisonous gas. Or maybe ominous ultrasonic beings who shatter their prey with high frequency sound waves. It is possible that entirely new chemical patterns of life may have developed on Mars. Life based on the silicon atom instead of carbon would be more resistant to the extreme cold, providing a whole new range of weird forms. Feeding on the drifting sand, tall crystal spires may grow to maturity in a single day to be shattered in a crescendo of destruction during the cold Martian night. Now, if there's one thing that man does better than imagine things, it's proved that what he imagined is fact. So I guess we'd better not dismiss any wild ideas as simple pipe dreams. We're reaching into space so fast that we sometimes forget that it hasn't been too many years since man was just dreaming of getting off the ground. Now, when he finally did, of course, it was a big step. And the story of the early day air pioneers is what we're going to bring you now. And to tell it, here's somebody who was in on the whole thing from the ground up, Professor Ludwig von Drake. Back in 
1917, they used to call me Captain Ludwig Eddie von Richthofen Drake. Because the very first time I flew in combat, I shot down five planes. Boy, did I make an ace of myself. They were our planes, that's why. <laughs> I've been wearing glasses ever since. Well, anyway, today, flying is taken for granted. You just press a button and the lights go out. No, what am I saying? And you in outer space. I used to fly them by the seat of my pants. I was a pioneer of the air. I flew the first corner Stoger wagon across the Oregon Trail. Instead of saying, go west, I would say, go up, young man. Going up was floor hats, fat shoes, and fat. But that's what this program is all about. Be pioneers of aviation. Now, in order that you get a completely unbiased viewpoint, I have decided to have a roundtable discussion with myself. That's the advantage of having a split personality. <laughs> now, you know, many countries claim credit for the airplane. We, oui, of course. A Frenchman was the first in the air. Good show, old bean. But what about that British pilot? He was the first, you know. It is Latin that honorable ancient Chinese ancestors were first to get something to fly. Ah, uh, you worry about the parachute. That was a magnificent Italian invention. Ah, but in France, we were the first to fly like a bird. I say, old chaps, the English were first. Ancient Chinese ancestor. Italian. France. Sorry, old boy. It was British ingenuity. Honorable ancestors. Balderdash. It was another Balderdash. He was a Da Vinci. Balderdash. Honorable ancestors. Honorable ancestors. He was the first Italian. Gentlemen, please, control yourselves. You bunch of nuts, you. <laughs> After all, I'd like to get a word in here someplace, too. Did you realize that ever since man was put on this earth, he has been trying to get off of it? He's always wanted to fly through the air like a bird and go high, high up in the sky. For thousands of years, the only flights man took, however, were flights of fancy, like in the Greek myth about Icarus. There are other legends of flight. Mercury, the swift messenger of the gods, with wings on his heels. And Helios, the sun god with his flaming chariot. And of course, the famous magic carpet from the Arabian Nights. But so much for dreams. The first people to really get something going were my honorable ancestors. Observe ancient Chinese map. As early as 400 BC, our ancestors knew that hot air rises. So they filled hollow paper dragons with hot air and flew them. Also first to populate the skies with many other things that flew. Chinese were first to get something off the ground. Sure, they got something off of the ground, a bunch of toys. <laughs> but in Italy, in the 15th century, we get big ideas about flying. Few people realize that the creator of the famous Mona Lisa often neglected his painting because of his interest in science. Yes, the great Leonardo da Vinci developed theories of flight that were very advanced for his day. And he tried them out with models. Not the same models he used for his paintings, of course. <laughs> he built the first parachute. He also invented the helicopter or as Leonardo called it, the aerial helix. The models were crude, and strangely enough, they flew, but not without mishap. People 
of his time were very superstitious and thought that these machines was inventions of the devil. So Leonardo withdrew and returned to his painting. But he never gave up his secret desire to give wings to man. He wrote his notes in reverse to preserve their secrecy. Being left-handed, he could do this easily. The first classified technical information in the very beginnings of aviation. It is my belief that man can fly by the power of his own muscles. I have designed this equipment to duplicate the wing structure of the bird. After Leonardo's death, a mirror revealed the meaning of his notes. His designs were called ornithopters, or mechanical birds. It was found that they could duplicate practically every motion of the bird, except fly and lay eggs. <whistles> ah, but 200 years later, man did fly for the first time. In France, of course. The year was 1783. Two brothers, Joseph and Etienne Montgolfier, shared the dream of flying. By chance, they noticed charred bits of paper rising from the fire. Ooh, that gave them an idea. They experimented with a bag made of paper. When the hot air filled the bag, it too was carried aloft. Elated by their discovery, they proceeded to build a big bag. It was a ramshackle affair of paper and linen, held together by buttons and buttonholes. The first double-breasted balloon. When this bag was filled with hot air, it swiftly rose 6,000 feet and drifted over a mile and a half of countryside. Because of its size and shape, the brothers called it Balaun, which means big ball. Shortly thereafter, François de Rosier, using a Montgolfier balloon, became the first aerial voyager in history. As a measure of safety, the balloon was anchored to the ground and permitted to rise only 85 feet. After a short time, the fire went out and the historic flight was over. When hydrogen gas became available, there was no limit to the time a balloonist could stay aloft. And so, man was launched into the era of lighter-than-air flight. Soon, all France was up in the air in balloons, which led to the foundation of the French Aeronautical Society. To celebrate the founding, Félix Nadar, a famous photographer and outstanding member of the society, built a balloon to end all balloons. In the fall of 1863, he took 15 of his friends aloft on a celebration flight. His balloon was aptly called La Jean, the giant, because it was almost 200 feet high and 100 feet in diameter. It had a two-story gondola made entirely of wicker. It had all the comforts of home, bedrooms with three decker bunks, a kitchen and a dining salon. There was even a dark room for Nadal's photography and, of all things, a printing press. For several hours, the party cruised serenely above Paris. to notice that the weather was changing. Captain Nadar tried to land, 
But Lejeune was at the mercy of the elements. In all, Lejeune traveled some 400 miles from Paris to Hanover, Germany, where the balloon finally came to rest. As if by a miracle, no one was killed. Undaunted, Captain Nadar restored his balloon and successfully made 29 more flights. Oui. So, naturally, you can see the French were the first to break the bonds that had chained men to the ground. You're probably wondering what these have to do with flight. And don't any of you smart Alex say that they are flying fish either. <laughs> That's fuel for that feathered flying machine out there. Hey, over. Time to fill her up. This is known as refueling in midair. <laughs> oh, look out, you crazy. Quit buzzing me, you seagoing buzzard. I'll have you grounded, that's what. Hmm. As you can see, Orville is one of the smoothest flyers in the world. He's also one of the hungriest. <laughs> but if it wasn't for flyers like him, the airplane might never have been invented. You know, by studying Orville here, that's my little assistant, you can discover all of the secrets of fly. All right, show him your most important secret, Orville. No, no, not that. What is your most important secret for flying? No, your wing is no secret. Orville, without it, you couldn't go up or down or sideways. Now, what is it? Ooh, it's your rudder and the elevator all in one, Orville. The rudder is on your other end. That's it, you seagoing peacock. Your tail. And you know who made that great discovery? A Britisher, of course. Early in the 19th century, up here in jolly old England, a nobleman, Sir George Cayley, became a student of nature's own aeronautical designs. He studied birds with the trained eye of an engineer. He observed that a bird's tail is as important to flight as are its wings. Birds execute their various flight maneuvers by coordinating the action of their wings and tails. Evaluating these observations, he designed a glider equipped with a tail and a rudder. Cayley's glider was completed, he could hardly wait to test it. The honor of being the first pilot, he offered to his trusted coachman. Bye, bye, bye. It was a very successful flight for 900 feet. although the landing was a bit rough. The coachman, though unharmed, gave up a promising career, and history's first pilot was never seen or heard from again. However, the flight was a milestone in aviation, earning Sir George the title of Father of Aeronautics. And the British Gold Medal for Aeronautical Achievement immortalizes his pioneering work. And to this day, all airplanes are equipped with tails and rudders. A few years later, another scientific bird watcher made an important discovery. He was one of us, which naturally spells U.S. This American 
American pioneer found out how birds can soar through the air without flapping their wings. And now, with little Orville's help, I shall explain this to you. Where is that feathered astronaut? <coughs> Oops. All right, Orville, come on out of there. Out of the hangar and taxi onto the runway, you big glutton. As you can see, I didn't call him a glutton. Boy, he's a regular flying boxcar. All right, Orville. Now you show him real good. All right. All clear for the takeoff. You ready, Orville? All right. Now give it a little more throttle. More throttle, Orville. All right. Now raise your flaps. Orville, this is it. All right. Pull her up. Pull her up. Hip. Well, at least this proves one thing. Never overload an airplane or a bird. <laughs> and speaking of birds, let's go back to 1884 and a very important discovery that was made by a bird watcher, John J. Montgomery, a professor from California. He has often been called the forgotten pioneer of aviation. He never got much credit. He often wondered how gulls could hover motionless on windy days, yet had to flap their wings when there was no wind. Finally, he found a solution. A bird's wing is curved, and a curved wing forces moving air to flow faster over the top than along the bottom. Now this creates a strong suction on the top of the wing that pulls it upward. The faster the air travels over the wing, the greater the lift. So a bird can hover whenever the air is moving. So, from nature's own design, Montgomery built the first heavier-than-aircraft in the United States and flew it in many daring flights. He lifted his glider by means of balloons and launched them from heights of up to 4,000 feet. He piloted his glider through spirals and dives he soared for 20 minutes at a time, covered up to eight miles, and made landings at a prearranged spot. Now, few people today know of the amazing work of this great American pioneer of aeronautics. Montgomery had given man his wings, and it seemed like everybody tried to use them. Fortunately, the motion picture camera had already been invented at that time. So we can see some of man's early attempts to compete with the birds. Trouble was, he was no competition. He couldn't stay up long enough. <laughs> what he really needed was some kind of propulsion. So once again, nature's design was tried with success. The next step was for man to try it himself. Folks, here I am with a new device called the ornithopter. Through a system of leverage advantage, plus a man's physical power, I believe it possible to fly as a bird. <clears throat> it appears heavy, <clears throat> it's light. <clears throat> Well, if at first you don't succeed... <laughs> and so more elaborate models were tried. And this time with leg power. Here, you see the rudder on tail? Just like I told you before. It was quite evident that man was going to need more than muscles to do the trick. You know, this might be hard to believe, 
but at the turn of the century, the aeroplane hadn't been invented yet. I ought to know, because this is when Von Dyke came into the picture. And speaking of pictures, I just happened to have one with me. <laughs> As you can see, I was trying to fly before I could even walk. And at that time, I was just a little shaver. Shaver? Looks like what I really needed was a haircut. <laughs> oh, Ludwig, you little darling, you. You are so cute. <laughs> oh, excuse me, I get taken away with a relative. Oh boy, this next one really brings back memories. The year was 1903. It was the year I got the bug. Not the flu or the measles or nothing like that. I got the flying bug. No. Oh boy, that flying bug almost killed me. Uh. Yes, 1903 was a big year in aviation history. And although I could do nothing right, there were a couple of brothers named Wright who could do nothing wrong. <laughs> they were a couple of real big wheels, these two bicycle builders from Dayton, Ohio. On the morning of December 17th, they set up on the sands of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, their first heavier than air flying machine. It actually had a motor, if you want to call it that. And almost 12 horsepower. The machine, complete with pilot, weighed almost 750 pounds. In order to launch the plane, a monorail track was designed. The biplane A runs on the wooden rail B. An anchor wire C holds the plane back to enable the motor to develop enough power for the takeoff. Everything is in readiness. The small crowd of witnesses looks on hopefully. Orville Wright is at the controls. One. Two, three, four. The motor races. It's a tense moment. Wilbur steadies the wing. Nobody steadies Wilbur. The plane strains at the anchor cable. Orville's hand gripped the controls. The wire is released. Twelve seconds, the right plane plows through the air in unmistakable, power-driven, man-carrying flight. Twelve seconds. Total distance was 120 feet. The five witnesses of this history-making flight were too startled, too thrilled to cheer. Success. Four flights Thursday morning. Starting from level, average speed through air, 31 miles. Inform press. Home Christmas, Orville Wright. Man's first powered flight. Yet, this epoch-making feat failed to impress a disinterested public. The only part of this stirring message that seemed newsworthy was the Wright brothers was going to be home for Christmas. Although the public lacked enthusiasm, fortunate for us, the Wright brothers didn't. Then, one day they made a revolutionary flight. For the first time, they was able to make a U-turn in midair and fly back in the opposite direction and not get a ticket. The daring Brazilian sportsman Alberto Santos Dumont made the first officially recorded European airplane flight. Soon many other intrepid airmen was flying in triplanes, biplanes, monoplanes, and multiplanes. Fantastic as they was in appearance, they all flew. Back in America... Gee Willikers, it says here the Army plans an air corps. The flying machine must make an endurance flight of one hour, carry pilot and one passenger, attain a speed of 40 miles an hour, travel 10 miles, and land undamaged. Well, doggone. 41 enthusiastic aeroplane builders submitted bids of somewhat varied amounts. I'll build a plane for a million dollars. I'll build it for a thousand. Mine will cost ten million. Three thousand. One thousand two hundred and thirty. Ten thousand. My plane will cost only five hundred and ten dollars. 
And one shrewd bidder guaranteed to build a plane for $45 a pound. <laughs> Looks more like a tank. However, when the government demanded a 10% forfeit be posted, all but three of these enthusiastic bidders hastily withdrew. The contract was given to the Wright brothers for one military airplane. Six months later at Fort Myer, delivery was made to the United States Army. And so the Wright brothers got the U.S. Air Force off on the right foot. Otherwise, it would be the U.S. Cavalry. We. Oui. But it was only a short time after that that a Frenchman, Louis Blériot, took off from the coast of France. And without the instruments, he made the 21-mile flight across the English Channel. Only a few realized the significance of this great flight. England was no longer isolated from the rest of Europe by an impassable body of water. Ah, but I say, old fellow, a channel flight of even greater significance was accomplished by a Britisher, the Honorable C.S. Rolls. After departing from England, his flight across the channel was quite uneventful. Reaching the other side and being recognized, he dropped greetings and, without stopping, returned home safely without mishap. Meanwhile, back in the good old U.S. of A, aviation saw another great advancement. Eugene Ely made the first takeoff from the deck of the USS Birmingham. Two months later, Ely reversed his feet by landing on the USS Pennsylvania, because he couldn't find the Birmingham. But this was the birth of the aircraft carrier. In 1911, the first experiments with seaplanes began. All ashore, that's going ashore. It wasn't until Glenn Curtis added a more powerful motor that seaplanes became a success. That same year also witnessed the first transcontinental flight. Racing against a 30-day time limit for a $50,000 prize, Galbraith P. Rogers took off from Long Island accompanied by a special train carrying spare parts. The flight consisted of 69 short hops and 15 crashes over rivers and mountains against tremendous odds, bucking strong winds and treacherous air currents, losing precious time. With unfailing courage and the will to win, the daring flyer crashed on and on. Rogers finally arrived at Pasadena with only one strut and part of the tail from the original plane. He just barely missed the prize by 19 days. Let's see, 30 and 19, and the nine carries over into the one, and the one loops over into the, and does a back hand, and that, <clears throat> well, let me see what, that's 56 days. Imagine that. Well, anyway, for the next few years, the flying machine continued to thrill the public. But it was regarded as a novelty with no practical use. At the tender age of 10, the airplane went off to war. At first, the aircraft was considered to have very little military value, except for observation purposes. A spirit of sportsmanship existed between rival pilots. And as they'd pass each other on their daily flights over the lines, they would wave a friendly hello and sometimes take pictures of one another, which led to a very unusual development. Sacre bleu! This is outrage! And so the next day. <coughs> and so the following day, not to be outdone, Fritz took a pot shot at Pierre. <coughs> with 
pistols, shotguns and rifles led to the installation of the machine gun. Successful but for one small little detail. The propeller got in the way. <laughs> Going down. Then science developed a synchronizing device to allow the bullets to pass between the revolving blades of the propeller. The airplane became a formidable weapon of war. The forced development of aircraft in these four years of war would have taken 20 years to accomplish in peacetime. And when peace finally came, the airplane had to struggle once again for existence. The Fly With Me Gypsy Flyer barnstormed all over the country. While people still regarded the airplane as an exciting novelty, far-sighted airmen were compelling the public to look upon aviation with a new respect. The United States Navy NC-4 flew from Newfoundland to England via the Azores. The first non-stop transatlantic flight was made by all Cock and Brown from Newfoundland to Ireland. First solo flight across the Atlantic, Charles A. Lindbergh, New York to Paris. First round-the-world flight, U.S. Army planes circled the globe. Flying time, 15 days, 11 hours. Post and Gary, 4 days, 10 hours. Howard Hughes, 2 days, 23 hours. Altitude flights developed superchargers and de-icers. Air racers improved design and advanced speeds. Power diving at 620 miles an hour tested durability and construction of planes. Commercial aviation got its start. The first airmail service in 1918 grew in a short time to major airlines with regularly scheduled transcontinental and then transoceanic passenger and freight service. Aviation was progressing at a tremendous pace. Time was being compressed, distance shrunk, range lengthened, and load capacity increased. The airplane, now flying all over the world, was the only weapon of war to develop such great usefulness in peacetime. You know, practically every day a new record is set by a jet or a rocket plane. Man is flying faster and higher than ever before. And louder, too. I don't know if that one broke a record, but it broke practically everything else. <laughs> In this modern age, you gotta be prepared. I bet a lot of you think that rocket power is a new idea. Well, let's see what our Chinese friend has to say. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chinese friend. Would you mind translating it a little bit? <laughs> oh, rocket, she very old, very old. Way back in 13th century, Honorable ancestors use rocket at the Battle of Kai Feng Fu. Oh, so, honorable ancestors make a lot of rocket with rocket. Five hundred years later, Sir Isaac Newton came up with an answer to this rocket phenomenon. For every action force, there is always an equal but opposite reaction force, whatever that means. Now, Sir Isaac's statement can best be illustrated by showing what happens to our pet pooch when he sneezes. You see? For every action, there is an opposite but equal reaction. This same principle applies when we light an ordinary skyrocket. Action, reaction. However, Gunpowder is not the only propellant that demonstrates the action-reaction law. 
There was a time when steam was seriously considered as a means of rocket propulsion instead of pressing pants. A fellow named Charles Golightly was to blame for this aerial steam horse. Early inventors soon realized that steam rockets would be too heavy to fly, so they went back to using gunpowder. They made many successful flights on paper. In 1865, Jules Verne fired the imagination of the world with his first book on space travel. It was called From the Earth to the Moon. Mr. Verne used a very interesting device in getting his heroes to the moon. He shot them through space inside a big artillery projectacle. That's a huge cannonball like. It was Verne's story that inspired George Méliès to create the first space travel motion picture in 1902. space in a rocket was Hermann Ganswind. Hermann's idea was to have the rocket pull the ship instead of push it. This conception was quite unique. However, there was one small problem. <laughs> it didn't work. However, the first real milestone in rocket history was passed when the American professor Robert H. Goddard invented a rocket which used gasoline and liquid oxygen instead of gunpowder. Believe it or not, it actually rose 50 feet into the wintry New England sky. His experiments led to the founding of the American Rocket Society. At the same time, the German professor Hermann Oberth wrote, theoretically, there is no limit to the size of a rocket which uses liquid fuel. In 1929, this same Professor Oberth designed a giant rocket ship for the Fritz Lang movie, Frau Imond, the girl in the moon. And it must have been successful because the picture and him and the rocket were never seen again. The late 20s and the early 30s saw an era of feverish activity among the rocket experimenters. Almost every type of vehicle was adapted to rocket power. Rocket-powered autos were fast, but they presented a little smoke problem. There were railroad rockets, and nautical rockets. These early attempts met with varying degrees of success. Some fired, and some backfired. <laughs> Here is the first successful flight of a rocket-powered airplane. Science marches on, and soon Rockets of all sizes and descriptions was being sent into space. And uh, there they go. Some of those V2s was PUs.
pockets got bigger and bigger and bigger. Space was filled up with satellites. Before long, there'll be space stations and space trains. There goes the commuter special right on schedule. <laughs> but whether you go tourist or first class, one thing is for sure, you better get yourself a round trip ticket. <laughs> The sky is filled with all kinds of things flying all over the place. But still, man's original dream has not been fulfilled. He still can't fly like Orville here, by flapping his wings. You think that's something? Well, pay close attention, because now, for the first time live on this program, Professor Ludwig von Dijk will fly like a bird. Contact! And it's up we go! <laughs> I bet you didn't think I could do it! 